Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to Harasses India uh, conference, and it's great to great to be part of this again. Um, today's topic is very interesting. It's about how Indian firms are, uh, you know, going global. The expansion of Indian companies abroad, um, and you know, we've seen in the last uh, many years now, and more so in the last year or so, that outbound, outbound investments from India have really gone an under uh, considerable change. But and it's not just in terms of sort of the volume of the investment, but also in terms of the geographical spread. So today we're going to look into where and what sectors are these Indian investments focused? What are the big challenges that you know COVID has 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 posed in front of Indian firms expanding abroad? We've recently just seen a massive IPO with Zomato. We are going to see a Paytm IPO, which is going to be as big as tech IPO. Um, so you know there is lots of stuff to talk about, and we'll we have a we have a brilliant panel to discuss that with. So let me introduce our panelists. Um, uh, we have Tarun Gupta, who's the managing partner, TNA Consulting, joining us from India. Uh, we have uh, Stephen Phillips, Director General, Invest Hong Kong, um, joining us from Hong Kong. Uh, we have Andrea Moni, co-founder and managing partner, Blue Spark Hub, joining us from Singapore. I'm Spriya Shravastiv. I'm joining you all from London. Um, I'm the executive editor for, in for the business division of Insider, um, and I've been in London for over 13 years, a journalist. Um, uh, but originally from India, so uh, you can imagine that this topic is very close to my heart. Um, and today, I think this topic is also very interesting and relevant at the moment as we read more and more about the growth and scalability of Indian companies across the world. Um, and I was also reading just the other day that it's also very interesting that Indian startups have raised more than $10 billion in funding in a record in just the first half of this year. Uh, I mean, I know you'll say that there's a lot of uh, easy money available out there because of the um, ultra loose monetary policy that the governments have. But it's still extremely interesting that there's just so much funding that's been provided to startups just at the start of this year. So I think we're going to focus a lot on, um, you know, what sectors are are very hot right now and what are the ways that, you know, to tap into these opportunities. So we'll hear both from an Indian perspective and from an international perspective as what what is it that, that's hot right now. And then we can't ignore the elephant in the room, COVID, that's brought about loads of challenges, right, in front of all of us. So it it actually pushed us back to the drawing board. We were all we all sort of started thinking about how best to evolve, how best to be innovative. And that was something that was seen across sectors. So this is not this is an, another sector, uh, and you know, investments is is definitely um, an area where investors started to get more and more, uh, you know, uh, sort of started thinking a bit more innovatively. How do I get my? How do I get returns in my money? Um, you know, traditional traditional ways of investing isn't the most lucrative at this stage. So people started going into Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, as we all know, which is again not the most regulated. But that's you know people want people want returns. And emerging markets have posed that sort of um, opportunity as well in front of investors. So we're going to uh, sort of talk a lot about that. But before that, I want to bring in our brilliant panelists. Um, give the, give you all three minutes to uh, give your opening statements. And then from there, we'll make it more interactive and go into question and answers. I see that we've got lots and lots of um, you know people active in the room as well now, our uh, listeners. If you have questions, please feel free to put them in chat, and I'll put them uh, you know I'll pick them up for you. We'll also do a proper fifteen minute Q and A at the end. So let's get started. Um, let's start with uh, Tarun. Tarun, if you want to give us a little bit of a you know sort of update on what really the Indian landscape uh, for investment is like right now, and then we'll take it from there. Yeah, thanks, Priya. Uh, a very good morning from uh, uh, Gurgaon, a suburb of New Delhi. A warm uh, morning. Uh, thank you, Priya, for laying the foundation for this panel discussion. Uh, before I uh, share my views, just as a background, as a firm, we are focused on attracting Indian outbound investments on behalf of investment promotion agencies from across the globe, and especially with North America and Europe. And we have seen a, a fundamental shift in the nature, the value, and the geographical focus of Indian outbound investments. Go back historically, Indian outbound investments were by large companies who were looking at resource-rich geographies. The Tata groups of the world, the Aditya Birla groups of the world, the large public sector, oil assets, coal assets. Uh, resource is still big. Then the second fundamental shift happened in the late 90s where it was led by three sectors. One is Indian information technology, a large player, automotive, and life sciences. 
and the approach was follow the customer so all the companies you have you have one the large ICT companies today they have development centers in over 100 countries you have over 1000 development centers that was the second wave of outbound investment and we are right now in the third wave which we will speak about later is what priya hinted at are the young tech companies some of them not so young because they've been in operation for 10 years but these are young tech companies who are going global and who are going global early at a stage the traditional entry barrier of capital availability of risk capital is not there i will speak later on the numbers on that spree already mentioned 10 million dollars and what are the two or three or four key assets number one aspects of outbound investments from india number one mna you look at any year mna accounts for probably 80 to 85% of all outbound investments and that mna is either to fill a technology gap acquire a customer or expand the product or service offering number one is mna number two is the deep tech uh, ecosystem of india uh, we will talk about some numbers how this deep tech companies are led by technocrats and the solutions are not india centric they are global solutions and most of them have uh, a global markets right from their inception the third is in terms of geography the elephant in the room is the united states you pick any year over the last decade united states would be amongst and the reason is uh, more capital available but also the single largest market for indian life sciences indian it indian automotive and fourth is the greenfield investments the manufacturing the logistics hub this is where we see the risk diversification coming into play especially after pandemic where some of our indian companies clients are saying we need you closer to us today we have seen export bans for some countries including india so and finally one topic which we how do we see this global minimum taxation how does that impact the routing of these fdi flows which have been through offshore centers how do we see that impacting i think uh, with that i'll take a pause and i uh, look forward to uh, taking participate in the panel discussion thank you Thanks Tarun those are actually very very interesting points and thank you for laying a background for us in terms of how you know the landscape has evolved um because you're right i mean uh, generally uh, we would always think about the big companies the tatas <clears throat> but the landscape has completely shifted now and whenever we talk about uh, investments into india or what's really happening it's always the big tech uh, companies the startups that we tend to talk about which is very interesting so i want to bring in stephen here now stephen you you have a you may have a very different perspective of this uh, entire thing so we would really like to hear from you now well spreya thank you and great to be joining everybody today um yeah i'll try and offer that perspective from hong kong um in terms of what we see in terms of indian bank investment um just so you know my role is um as invest hong kong which is um, the inward investment agency of the hong kong government um clearly there's been long standing ties between india and hong kong and we have a very significant indian diaspora um here in hong kong so there's some very long standing maybe third fourth generation um investment in hong kong um but we're seeing a lot of new investments and a lot of new interests um i guess just some general observations on what i'm seeing in terms of fdi interest in this part of the world um uh, and then may go on to what i'm seeing a little bit more specifically in terms of india um and i would mention that india is very important to us in hong kong uh, and we've got a dedicated team in mumbai um to support indian companies clearly the economic fallout of covid means that companies around the world are looking for growth opportunities um and that naturally leads a lot of companies to look at east asia with um china as probably the leading part of that engine of the economic growth and certainly what we're seeing is very robust interest um from all around the world it literally is at every continent where we're seeing that interest um the biggest challenge in the context of hong kong is that we have had very strict covid regulations so the ability to travel here at the moment um it is the biggest single impediment to actually closing investments in terms of what we see from india 
Um, I, I think probably Hong Kong is around the 15th or 16th largest destination for Indian FDI in the last um, couple of years. China, interestingly, despite being the second largest economy in the world, is only around the 25th largest, um, which perhaps is something where there's a significant opportunity. In terms of sector um, investment from India, it's pretty broad. Um, Financial services, food and drink, logistics, obviously IT. Um, Very special to India is jewellery and diamonds, something um, that is very specific. Probably India is the only place in the world, actually, that has such a big representation here in Hong Kong. But then probably the hottest areas that I'm seeing are really in tech, and that's both big tech and small tech. Um, We're seeing a lot of engagement between the startup communities um, in fintech in particular, um, a little bit in biotech. And we're also seeing quite a lot of interest in Hong Kong as a destination for family offices. I think one of the other interesting things, perhaps, for Indian companies is that some 600 or so international companies that are in Hong Kong um, actually manage their Indian operations out of Hong Kong, which, again, adds something in terms of um, partnership um, opportunities. Um, Lastly, maybe just um, what, what I see as the big opportunities, Hong Kong itself, a mature economy, Um, similar perhaps to the UK, which might be a little bit more familiar to many Indian companies. What we have um, in southern China is a region called the Greater Bay Area. That's Hong Kong, Macau, nine cities in Guangdong. Um, It's the 10th largest economy in the world already. Possibly by 2030 will be the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world. The most affluent consumers in China and some of the most innovative companies in China. Um, so it's an area where we see lots of opportunity, lots of opportunities, um, particularly, I think, for Indian tech companies, but also picking up the trade and investment flows. China itself, of course, offers opportunities still, um, and East Asia more generally. And then probably the final thing that I would say is the overlay of RCEP. Um, we think is going to see much higher growth in this part of the world. Um, And what that also is indicating is that the trade and investment flows, they're changing a little bit from east-west, more to north-south. So particularly for service sectors, picking up where these new trade and investment flows are really developing is an opportunity, I would say, for Indian companies. Great. Thank you very much, Stephen. That's very, very helpful. Um, And uh, we'll go to Andrea now, but I've I've just seen that Aarti has joined us as well. So Aarti, thank you for joining us. Um, Just to introduce uh, Aarti, Aarti Junjunwala is the Executive Director at uh, Finotex Chemical India, and she's joining us from India uh, today. Um, Aarti, just to get you up to speed, we are just getting opening statements from all our uh, panelists on what their, uh, on their views on the Way sort of the landscape for you know outbound outbound investments have changed for Indian companies. Um, so let's go, to Andrea. Um, Andrea, you you were just talk, telling me that you're you're based in Singapore and you know you've been there for for a while now and you've been sort of dealing with a lot of companies, um, you know sort of Chinese companies, but not as much Indian companies as of yet. But when you look at the landscape and when you look at Indian companies, what is your uh, point of view? Where do you see uh, investments very hot at the moment? Um, Andrea, I think you're on mute. Okay, sorry. Yeah, okay. Thanks. And uh, thanks to Stephen and Arun for uh, laying down the work for me. <laughs> I would say that in Singapore, there is um, quite a bit of investment. Uh, I guess uh, the landscape is similar to Hong Kong. Uh, and uh, But what happened in Singapore is, I would call it a mostly sort of a reverse FDI, because it's um, a lot of Indian companies, Indian families, they set up uh, maybe vehicles or holdings in in Singapore for then reinvest uh, reinvest in India. So that's a sort of a um, sort of a, I would say a bit of a drug up investments. But uh, if we if you look more at uh, at the global level and uh, and the Indian companies expanding abroad, I I think Tarun uh, Tarun got it right when he was talking about the different phases of. Uh, overseas investment of Indian companies. That in the beginning we were looking at either investments in the 
in the ICT sector where companies were basically following uh, following the clients, so going going where the clients were to offer a, to offer a better service, and uh, and also we're looking at uh, maybe I would say infrastructure, all the heavy industries like the like ArcelorMittal did in did in Europe, that basically to cover the whole steel industry of Europe, including including Italy. And uh, so right now I think we are we are uh, we are gonna we're gonna look at the at the fourth phase is probably. Not there yet because the um, startup scene in India is not as mature as um, as it as is uh, is in China. I mean, India there's not still an uh, Indian Alibaba or an Indian uh, Indian Tencent, which is uh, which is probably a factor of the, of the of the Indian consumer market that is still very is still very fragmented and is is a is a victim of the of the logistics and the, and the jurisdiction. But it's uh, it's definitely changing, and then. Uh, in that respect, COVID is uh, is helping for as much as help COVID can help because it's um, is acceler- is accelerating definitely a trend towards e-commerce uh, digitalization, and I believe that in the next two three years we will see the we will see the Indian uh, some in, some big Indian players getting into the getting into the getting into the in, into the global scene uh, and. Uh, mm. <coughs> And that's and then another thing to consider that uh, India Indian companies they tend to be also very strong in the in the B two B sector so probably something we don't see much like companies working in the in the deep uh, deep deep data or deep or the or deep science that so companies that are most likely are in, are are investing in the U S but we don't see them because they they work together with uh, the Amazons the Facebook providing the providing the infrastructure. Great, thank you, Andre. That's very, very helpful. Um, Arti, over to you. Hello, hello, everybody. Yes, am I audible? I think I am. Yes. Uh, yes, so uh, I would like to introduce myself. I missed a little bit of the talk uh, amongst our panel this morning because I was on another uh, talk somewhere else and I apologize for missing that. So, um, so uh, uh, I'm in the promoter family of Finotex Chemical Limited. It's an Indian company. We have factories in India and also we have acquired a stake in a Malaysian company, which is a European managed company, Biotex Malaysia. And uh, coming to our topic, which is Indian f- firm global expansion even during this pandemic we are uh, looking at some organic and inorganic growth overseas we are uh, looking at uh, you know having uh, a stake in an australian company and also in a european company uh, uh, which is during the pandemic that we see the scope because of China plus one strategy that uh, is going on. Most of the imports uh, and exports and trade from China has been quite uh, uh, slow or I would say quite challenging for them. So the world is depending on India per se for a lot of their trade. And um, we are a public listed company. We are on the stock market for of, uh, of the country of National Stock Exchange and Bombay Stock Exchange. And uh, we see a lot of scope uh, when uh, it comes to Indian companies going, growing abroad in overseas market. And, uh, and, uh, um, and the way I would say we have our labor or we have our cost, a lot of international fund houses, a lot of banks, a lot of investors or high net worth ind- individuals are looking at Indian companies for investing over here. So, um, so yes, this is, uh, this is something that I had to say. That's great. Thank you, um, Ardi. Thank you all for your comments. We've got 25 minutes left and I also want to spend some time in the end for, but for question and answers for the audiences. I can see some questions coming through, but two very interesting themes have emerged. One, I think, um, Andrea made a really, really interesting point that, um, you know, yes, Indian companies are going global. Yes, we are seeing expansion, but, India still doesn't have an Alibaba or a Tencent. Um, and, you know, it's it's a mature market. It's 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 been there for so long. But what, so my question, one first question is, what is stopping Indian companies from being listed on the New York Stock Exchange, for instance? When do we see a Zomato being listed on the New York Stock Exchange or a Paytm? Um, first question. Second question I have is about tech companies. I know we're talking a lot about tech companies and startups and how that's a really big um, area. Um, but there's also this entire debate that goes uh, between. Uh, can you guys hear me? Because I because I'm getting a message that my internet is a bit 
off. Okay. So the second yes. uh, point that's emerging here is a little bit about how um, this sort of debate between growth and scalability that, you know, s- startups are growing very quickly. They're, they're growing very quickly. Like Uber, for instance, if you take Uber's example in the US, they they raised funding and they went straight into IPO, had had sort of down into IPO. And it wasn't the best, the, it wasn't the best IPO, it wasn't the most successful IPO. So in India as well, we see loads of startups that are raising a lot of funding. Um, and if you see a soft bank report, it really talks about this cliff after the seed funding round before the series A, that loads of these um, startups really fall into that cliff, the cliff of death, as they call it. So, um, so so two questions. So first question, let's look at what is stopping Indian companies from going absolutely global and getting listed on the New York Stock Exchange and the you know sort of global stock exchange. And second, um, the tech startup industry in India, is that getting saturated? Is are we really seeing saturation of tech startups in, 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 in India because there's so much funding, but we don't really see them go beyond a certain level. So um, I'm going to make it keep it open now. Whoever wants to jump in first, please go ahead and we'll take it from there. Tarun, I see you've unmuted. So go for it. Sure. Uh, uh, the, the, I'll just take very quickly both the questions because we worked with an overseas stock exchange for a couple of years. Number one reason for that Priya, are the regulations of which, although the regulations have been relaxed, where Indian companies from 2018 unlisted entities were allowed to list overseas. But unfortunately, we're still operating, uh, awaiting the modalities of the tax, which is implications for existing investors. So, so that's the number one uh, question there is the tax clarity uh, as a result of which you've not seen, despite the Sahu Committee report, I won't go into the details. And the second part you mentioned on an Indian equivalent of a Tencent, Indian equivalent of an Ant Group, uh, whatever we call it, you see now we are at an early stage of a flywheel effect. Okay, we had very successful exits from the likes of uh, Flipkart earlier, right? Uh, wherein uh, Walmart, and now we are seeing investors actually getting returns. Otherwise, India was very infamous that you put in your money, everything is long term. Long term, we are all dead. But the last few years, we've seen reasonable level of exits. As a result, Indian family offices are seeing investments in companies as an alternative asset. You are seeing large number of entrepreneurs who have made exits, who have made money, funding, creating uh, new additional uh, new startups. We have very good example, for example, of Zoho, an Indian product like company who has in turn created a flywheel of startups. Uh, and now these are the deep tech startups or the SaaS based startups which are venturing global. See, you have to segregate startups into three categories. One are the India consumption story, the edtechs of the world, the fintechs of the world. They are looking at more emerging markets, Southeast Asia. The deep tech, the AI, the blockchain, the robotics, these are all companies who are looking at developed markets. You get a better pricing. And uh, third would be more are large uh, uh, companies who are now looking at startup nations like Israel, geographies like Switzerland, where they can get talent for computer vision, for e-mobility. So that's how, and I would stick my neck out and say, we may not have the equivalent of Tencent or and, but we will have fairly large number of companies who have this technology and who would have a cluster approach for new geographies. Great, thank you, Tarun. Um, who wants to go next? Stephen. Yeah. Maybe I could just make some observations. I think on the listing side, that that's very true um, in terms of regulation. I think the other issue is um, around valuation in the longer term, even when regulations ease, um, obviously having deep investor pools that understand that India well enough um, may be an impediment. Um, Look, on the tech startup side, looking at India from Hong Kong, I don't see what's happening in India as that different to anywhere else. I don't see a particular problem that um, Indian startups aren't flourishing um, in similar rates to what what I see elsewhere. So I I would say it's a pretty familiar pattern. Um, In terms of the startups that we're seeing out of India, looking at this part of the world, they really are world class. Um, some great technology, um, wh- whether it's um, in terms of AI, um, absolutely categorically easily um, ad- adaptable to global applications. 
Um, they, they definitely are not sort of parochial, um, only looking to solve problems within India. Um, now, it's a relatively small number volume wise, but I tell you that they are um, up there amongst the best in the world, I would say. Um, also, the, the bit that Taran mentioned about family offices looking at um, investing in startups, that's something that we're also seeing. And that includes family offices here um, who are looking at opportunities in India. Um, obviously, the the sort of the desire is that there's high growth potential, significant markets. Um, but again, I think it just goes to this point that at least some of the startups in India are really seen as world class from investors um, outside. Great, thank you. Um, uh, so, what's what's really stopping these startups from going global then, or are they just taking taking the time to really understand the Indian market a bit more before they take ste- take steps outside? Uh, why don't we see a lot of Indian startups going global? I guess from my point of view, it tends to be obviously you've got a very large domestic market. So the imperative to internationalize is somewhat lower than if you've got a a small domestic market. And we see similar things in the work that we do in China. That that would be my guess. Sorry if I... No, no, go ahead. Go, Andrew, Andrew and then Arti. No, I think it's that, I mean, Tarun, correct me if I'm wrong, and most likely a lot of these... uh, I would call it. Uh, I know if 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 you if you want to call them B two B startups or infrastructure startups, they are already international. We just know it because it's um, because for instance, recently I discovered there's an Indian company that is providing uh, all the compression and delivery uh, algorithms and infrastructure for Netflix all over the world. I had uh, I, I had no idea this kind of thing existed, but uh, it does exist. It just it just we don't know it. Um, I think it is a. It is a factor of the different, probably, of the different, um, of the different structure of India as a country compared to compared to China, or compared to or compared to the US, compared to Europe. In uh, China, China, US, Europe are very much consumer consumer driving driven economies. So what we see, we see Amazon, we see Uber. Why? Because they're, they're companies we deal with every day. We don't uh, we don't see the companies behind the scenes that. Um, Behind the scenes that uh, support the, those companies like Zoho. Zoho, uh, how many people know Zoho? Not many, but uh, most likely uh, your your provider for your uh, what many of your uh, prov- uh, suppliers are using Zoho as a CRM because it's uh, is a pretty good CRM and is uh, I would say ten times cheaper than Salesforce. So it's. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, that's a really good point. And I think, uh, you know, funnily, you know, I, I live in London and sitting here in Europe when we are sometimes covering big stories about tech as well, we realize that actually Europe has no tech company of its own. We constantly keep writing about Google and Facebook and uh, Netflix and Amazon. But the only only biggest IPO that UK had recently was Deliveroo and it fell flat, absolutely bombed at the um, at the exchange. So I think it's a very similar situation. I think it's, it's, it's sort of not known. These companies are not as much known. Known, so you automatically sort of put, you know, turn a turn a blind eye to it. Arti, I know you wanted to say something, so let me bring you in. Yes, yes. So, um, belonging to the textile chemical uh, industry, to the chemical industry of India, I can say that, uh, you know, these chemicals are ba- mainly produced in the Asian side of the world. Like I would say, China, India, a few of them are produced in Taiwan or uh, countries like that. But um, seeing the like, like you said, like uh, the tech part, the tech technology companies are all made in India. If you see, like, you know, they are Bangalore based, South India based companies, and most of the startups are from there. So I, I if, if it, I have to talk about our growth story, being an Indian specialty company, chemical company, I would say that. Uh, so if like the company was founded in uh, like 40 years ago and we got listed about like, uh, you know, like 20 years ago. So we took our time in getting listed and it was a phase wise listing. We got listed on the Bombay Stock Exchange first and then on the National Stock Exchange of the country. Then we acquired like a majority stake in we are acquiring in a we are still in a phase of acquisition of stakes in you know, strategically positioned companies who complement our businesses. So there is a good scope of Indian companies uh, expanding abroad. But uh, coming back to your question, I would be it would always be like a plan and strategic growth, phase wise growth. So uh, like to like we 
started with acquiring a European managed and founded company Malay in Malaysia and we we bought the stake because of the strategic location now today we are considering buying a majority stake in a company in Belgium we are buying that because of their branding and because of the reach they have from your to the various parts of the world so having said that i would like to say that we are also expanding like belonging to an indian company and belonging to a listed company uh, you know growing in the global scenario of today and also we have uh, i would say diversified into various uh, chemicals today we are also into home and hygiene our sanitizers and our cleaning detergents which other companies like diverse or eco lab or these you know these big brands are so we are yeah. looking at you know jv with them and uh, if i have to answer your question i would say that indian companies do look at these opportunities uh, of course we have i i r eyes on them but we uh, wait for the time when we can actually go out and you know start talking about it and close the deals so right. uh, this is for your answer yeah no absolutely that's a very interesting point so two things so due the proper due diligence is absolutely needed yes. so you know absolutely. you're able to jump at the right time um yeah. and you need to just make sure that your uh, you know you it, it suits your requirement as well yes. um yes. so uh, you know uh, yeah yes yeah. So acquisitions Yes, and like you said, the due diligence and it should it should add the value to the customers or the B two B businesses that we are already into. It right. has to blend over there. Perfect. Okay, so final final question before we open it for question and answers from the audiences. And if you have questions, please please go ahead and write it in comments. Um, we can't ignore COVID. Um, it's it's around us. It's it started about a year and a half ago, and you know we are in this for a very long time. how do you think that has changed the 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 thinking or the landscape around um, indian companies how has covid come into play for a lot of industries we saw that they went back to the drawing board they really had to think about how how do we go back to uh, you know innovate innovating ourselves changing ourselves um in this current context um in this in this top in the context of this topic how has covid really posed both sort of challenges as well as maybe a blessing in disguise in some way um so tarun can we start with sure, you thanks uh, uh just the background and i'll keep it focused on the outbound investments because that's the topic see india does not have very large firms unlike china we have there was a mckinsey study we have about 600 odd big firms which account for 40% of our turnover and about 5000 odd firms from 40 million to half a billion dollar turnover okay now going back to what arthi's comment for outbound investments due to covid we have seen large number of indian companies in chemical space in manufacturing space who are looking at setting up a smaller production unit assembly unit close to their large markets be it southeast asia be it us that's number one clear change at the moment we are talking to several indian companies who are looking at a setup mainly in the us or other geographies and the second aspect is on so let's not startups are important technology is important but we also have to understand there's a large pool of our traditional indian companies who are large investors mothers and sumi has plants in 85 plants you know in uh, god knows how many countries okay so large so let's not ignore they are large investors themselves okay second is in terms of the the technology companies they are earlier it was all about following the customer but they are now looking at talent uh, despite all the positive news about indian talent there are certain segments whether it's data scientists whether it's cyber security where whether it's computer vision ai where indian companies are uh, analytics they are chasing talent they are working with colleges with the universities to make sure that the curriculum is relevant they are asking questions what are the number of graduates coming because they need that kind of talent in those geographies as well so these are the two changes we have noticed over the last 18 months right that's great um yeah let's go over to stephen before i ask any more questions because i would love to hear from all of you on this topic yeah i i guess i don't have the um, the deep insights that tara and, and arty would have in terms of what indian companies are thinking um the, the sort of more generic um issue that i'm seeing really is that companies a picking up on Terence point really about manufacturing are looking at diversifying supply chains in essence um and secondly i think a lot of the companies that we're working with really are looking at diversifying their global portfolio because those companies that have found that they're very very 
um, that focus on just one particular market have realized that may not be the best type of approach when um, the world is in a, a very, very large state of flux, but they're, they're generic comments. Perfect, let's go to Arthi and then Anne. Um, again, talking from my perspective, from my point of view, I would say that uh, there, uh, with COVID, the big elephant coming in the room, a uh, lot of Indian companies have taken it like an opportunity rather than a challenge. When it comes to us, we um, uh, we cater to majority textile companies and textile mills around the world. As soon as uh, the COVID lockdown was announced in the country, uh, we saw that most when we export to about 69 countries around the world, so uh, a lot of them started telling me that, hey, RT, we are not buying textile chemicals anymore. We are buying only, you know, disinfectants. We are buying only hand rubs and we are buying only alcohol based cleansers. So do you make that? And with that, we started a, a new range to our company. We started producing. We have our own hygiene uh, division today with about 40, 47 products which we manufacture and even supply globally. We started a new avenue and also uh, we could foresee that once this pandemic comes to an end after the vaccinations are done, we foresee that the, you know, the quantities would jump, the demand would jump in every sector because it would be the new way of life, cleaning, hygiene and these products would be the new way of life. So coming back to it, uh, we even diversified, we invested in plants, we invested in, you know, factories, machinery to take the future in mind, uh, we made these changes. So COVID was challenging, but if like for us, we took a lot of measures to make sure we continue what we are doing. At the same time, it was a good chance to dive. I'm sorry, to diversify. And at the same time, it was a time to grow. So back end, we were growing and the forward going forward, we diversified our portfolio. That's 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 such a good point. And that's what a lot of companies who've managed to stay afloat did. Right. I mean, when when uh, COVID and the pandemic hit and people started running out of things like um, sanitizers, we saw loads and loads of companies really jump in to make these things and create these things. And another another innovation we saw was all of these ghost kitchens or dark kitchens uh, step, you know, sort of cropping up here and there, um, across. And I think India is a big market. I was just reading about the amount of uh, ghost kitchens that have actually emerged in India now. Um, and, you know, those are the things that, that has taken Zomato into IPO, right? Because people yes. have been home, people have been ordering um, and, and the companies have stayed afloat. So, yes, I mean, there is there are definitely opportunities that uh, a lot of industries have really jumped into. Um, Andrea, I know you wanted to say something as well. So over to you now. No, I just wanted to to follow and to um, to follow up on the COVID, uh, the question about COVID. Is it COVID? I mean, I think all over the world, COVID um, got a, a strong push toward modern, modernization of companies, meaning that it's uh, most companies have uh, have, um, have, uh, have, uh, have to deal with uh, hybrid work, uh, hybrid work solutions, digitalization. So this, for sure, has forced a lot of companies which uh, were were inefficient to become more efficient. So this is definitely has helped uh, and also maybe in, uh, in countries like um, like India or Italy where the work culture was more, more tra traditional than in the US. So that's a definitely, COVID has been has been a blessing in disguise for this. And, um, and, and then if you look at more traditional industries like the chemical industries, for sure right now there are a lot of opportunities in, um, in, the, in the industrialized world where, uh, where it's because of uh, regulations, because of cost, a lot of um, Traditional investors are leaving that sector, so it is a big opportunity for companies coming from uh, for emerging from emerging markets to to make acquisitions and get uh, and get market share. Great. Uh, okay, so we've got what five minutes now, so we've got two questions from audiences. And Sushil Premchand um, asked the first question: says, could the panelists please comment on the relative ability of Indian entrepreneurs to understand the cultural attitudes in Europe? letting competent managers get on with their business. Um, who would like to answer that? Tarun, I'll take it up. I see you raised your I'll hand. I'll take it up. Hi, good morning, uh, Sushil. Uh, Sushil is a good friend, uh, known him for a while. Uh, Sushil, you hit on a very, very good topic, and I'm glad you brought it up because we all talk about capital, growth opportunities, and we forget the cultural nuances. I would still say that uh, the cultural adaptability of the new age entrepreneur is higher 
than maybe we have seen a decade ago with some of the other industries. Uh, most of them have early exposure, even education, to a different environment. And they are relatively more open for a team of competent managers in that jurisdiction. It's not easy for them to loosen the hold, but it is definitely better than what we have seen a decade ago with some of the traditional industries. But it's still a learning curve. And before I sign off, Sriya, just on your cloud kitchen, my good friend Rebel Foods do that kitchen in London through Holy Cow. He's a good, uh, he's a batchmate. So please try those cloud kitchens. <laughs> sure. Yeah. No, I've heard of Rebel Kitchen. Rebel kitchen. Um, yeah, and and we've, I mean, we've survived the pandemic because of Dark Kitchen. So you know, that's absolutely true. Um, okay. The next question is from R R Shibu. With the ongoing India-China issues, are the Chinese investments on a permanent nosedive? Um, I feel like Stephen and possibly Andrea um, could be able to shed more light on that. So Stephen, if you would like to take that question first. Yeah, perhaps I can answer it by making an observation on another strained geopolitical relationship, US-China, um, where I see almost a parallel universe between the political rhetoric on Capitol Hill and what US companies um, and Chinese companies are doing um, on the trade and investment front. So um, if I look at... Um, U.S. investment going into um, China that has continued to increase throughout the last um, few years that have been very turbulent on the geopolitical front. And certainly when I look at it in the context of Hong Kong, um, again, we see very strong interest. So just by answering it that way, maybe that becomes a decision for companies to decide what's in their best interest versus um, following a p geopolitical lead. Yeah. Um, Andrea, would you like to comment on that? Sure. I think it is, um, it's, a, it's a factor of the different uh, relationship there is between uh, China and India at the moment. That it's, uh, I would say that uh, uh, right now there's a big, uh, between the US and China, there's a big, uh, that there's a big, there's a big battle at the geopolitical level to, to to control the world. Let's say it's so obviously that's uh, there are a lot of um, there are a lot of issues between uh, foreign between foreign investment between U.S. and China, and uh, there are there have been restrictions between uh, between between each country. So that's um, that's a big reason. While while with the U.S. and India there is a more friendly relationship at least at this stage. Then we don't know whether it will continue, but <laughs> that's uh, that's how it is at the moment. Yeah, and I've literally just seen, uh, thanks to RR Shibu, that um, Arti, your company, the shares have gained over three hundred percent in the last year. Um, tell us, tell us, is was was that is that sort of really going back to the drawing board and coming up with new ideas? How did you guys manage to do that? Uh, yes, uh, thanks to, to the good kind comments from RR Shibu, and thank you, Spira. So, uh, like I was you know, explaining myself earlier, and I have been sharing that in this pandemic, we changed a lot of strategies. We tried to look at a lot of opportunities which could grow the company in a permanent way and not like a, you know, temporary due to the pandemic change. So we have recently uh, had a joint venture with an Australian company called HealthGuard. They are into primarily into, uh, you know, anti-mosquito, anti-viral, anti-mite, and all these kind of finishes for the textiles. So for like, you know, your beddings, for your clothing, for your uh, homeware, for, uh, you know, the stuff that we wear. So these are like antivirals and um, antibacterial and antimicrobial finishes. So we have invested and joined hands with HealthGuard Australia in the last like one month we have uh, expanded our production capacity in the last one year we have uh, uh, you know diversified our portfolio and started a completely new range in the last one year and we are looking at two more growth opportunities one in the europe and one in india itself which would complement our portfolio so because of all this and also China plus one is helping a lot. Uh, I see somebody's comment over there also on China plus one. So the freight from India to and like we export to 69 countries around the world, the freight to all these countries were earlier 
$1,200 or $1,500 versus for like $10,000 a container today. And what we see is that everybody's ready to pay for that high charge, which is into, I don't know, into crazy amount of times that it used to be. And the customers are absorbing that charge today and they prefer to work with a good reputed branded Indian company versus a Chinese company, uh, I don't know, due to freight or due to uh, less of reliability over there. So because of all these changes that have happened and things that we've incorporated in the last one and a half, two years, we see the growth, which uh, is well noticed and commented by uh, Mr. Ara Shibu and also by R. I. Narayan here, which I can see. Perfect. Thank you very much. Well, we've run out of time, but I'm going to give you all 15 seconds each to give me a closing statement, one line, really, a tweet, a tweet uh, length line on what is the future for Indian companies. 15 seconds each. I'm going to start with Tarun. Okay. I go uh, four segments from outbound investments from India, SaaS, deep tech, precision medicine, and uh, robotics advanced manufacturing. That's for the next wave. Thanks. Perfect. Um, Stephen, over to you. Yeah, great opportunities for Indian companies in East Asia through Hong Kong. Give me a shout if I can help. <laughs> That's awesome. Andrea. <laughs> sure. I think there's a, there's a bright future, especially in the, um, as Arun said, in the, in the deep tech sector where, um, where the competences of Indian companies are, are excellent. Uh, Arthi. I would say uh, the scope from India would be, of course, technology would be pharmaceutical and textile and chemical sector, which I belong to. So these three industries, I see a good scope. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for your time, all of you. It's been such a pleasure moderating this panel. Um, even though I had to wake up at 5.30 a.m. on a Saturday morning in London, uh, I really enjoyed every bit of this panel. So thank you I for your time. Uh, sorry? I hope we can connect with everybody on LinkedIn. And, yes, you know, please, let's connect amazing. everyone. Let's stay in touch. But thank you again for all of you for your time, for the comments, the audience. Thank you for your questions as well. It's been a pleasure hosting this. And uh, yeah, I wish you all um, a happy weekend and uh, speak to you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks a lot, Bye -bye. everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.